everyone. Welcome back to Faraday Academy. My name is Gwen, and today I am very excited to be joined by a good friend of mine, Jake Korn, who is a tech lead. And I'll actually let you introduce yourself really quickly to everyone, and then I'll explain kind of the outline and what we want to get out of the stream. So cool. go ahead. Well, I'm honored to be here with a good friend of mine, Gwendolyn Faraday. Um, I'm Jake Korn. I'm a, currently a tech lead at Progressive Insurance. And um, Gwen and I, I think we've known each other maybe five years. And uh, it's been a while since we've talked, so I'm happy to be here. Awesome. I think we actually met through Free Code Camp all those years ago. I think we did. You guys were taking in um, uh, rejects off the street like me, you know. <laughs> yeah, we started... Uh, long story short, we started a local free code camp group here, and Jake was one of the original people who joined. So we've known each other many years. We've kind of watched each other as we've grown as developers and in the community, and we've both taken on more of a leadership role in development and gone through the process from junior uh, developers getting into the industry through mid and senior level developers. And now Jake is a tech lead. So I really wanted to have him on and talk about some of the progression in his career, about different types of leadership responsibilities. And if you're interested in becoming a team lead, what that might look for you and some of the skills and things that you might want to know first. So are you ready, Jake? No, but let's do it. <laughs> okay, so you've already introduced yourself, but I want to dig a little bit deeper and know more about your path, like how you got here to be a tech lead and why you took on this role in the first place, or did it kind of naturally evolve? So the role is something that someone else assigned to me. Um, it was nothing that I necessarily pursued, but it's something I definitely welcome um, as a new challenge. Um, my path for 10 years or so, I was um, I was a professional touring musician. I worked five years on cruise ships, and then I worked five years mostly in the Deep South, playing in Memphis and uh, and other places around. Um, one day I was I was touring, and I saw a guy coding. I thought it was much cooler than music, and uh, started studying, started started reading as many books as I could, and getting my hands as dirty as they could possibly be. Um, at some point, I found Free Code Camp and found Gwen and started asking her loads of questions and she taught me loads of stuff. Um, <laughs> since then, I would say that my progression has been um, mostly trying to find as many thought leaders as I could, listen to what they had to say and try to read their books as much as possible and try to find out what's working and just turn up the good. Awesome. So mm -hmm. what types of jobs did you take that kind of led you into this role? Um, give us kind of a progression. The, the musician thing was definitely something to lead me to something with a steady financial <laughs> life. <laughs> give you some motivation. Yeah. Um, but also it sort of seeded me for the, um, or it, it prepared me in some ways for how to learn something because learning music is not too different from learning tech. You play a song, you record yourself, you get feedback and you start to get an impression whether you're improving or not. With software development, it's the same thing. The proof is in the pudding. Your programs sort of either work or they don't at your earliest phase. And then they're either maintainable or they're not as you start progressing. Um, so I would say music was definitely a, a big motivator for me. Um, some of the earlier jobs I had were as, were as a consultant, um, mostly a staff aug. And I didn't I don't know if I had the chops that I needed at the time for those positions. So and, real quick, yeah. I want to interrupt you. Go for uh, it. If anyone doesn't know staff aug, it's a common term in consulting. It's short for stack staff augmentation, where you'll work for this consulting company full time, but they'll send you away to another company. Usually it's, it's a larger company. Sometimes it's a startup, um, but they'll have you work full time at that other company, but you actually work for, the consulting company and they're just placing you for usually at least six months to a year at this company who just needs more developers to do something for them. If you don't get fired first, I'm just kidding. 
um but yeah that's a that's a good explanation so yeah um sort of being added to projects and being forced into different technologies made it so that i wanted to learn more and sort of made it so that i recognized that what i would have liked in a tech lead had i had one um uh -huh. or had it been a different tech lead or what did i like about that certain tech lead that's um, an interesting take sorry i keep no no you. no go for it that's really an interesting take that I guess I hadn't thought of in consulting because I really loved that I went through consulting for years because it, mm -hmm. like you said, it let me try all those different technologies. But at the same time, you're right. You get to work with a lot of different tech leads and, you know, agile or scrum masters and stuff. So you really get to see what's working and what's not. So that's a that's a good perspective and probably something that helped you a lot, you know, moving into the tech lead role. Well, thank you. I mean, I don't know if I'm doing good, but I'm doing better than I once was, you know? It seems like your team is happy with you. That's what I say, at least. <laughs> awesome. So you went through your consulting years and then you started work working internally or full-time for companies? Yeah, I wanted to know what the difference was, essentially. Um, I had always been a consultant. I wanted to know what the difference was as being a direct employee. <clears throat> And so kind of went into that thing. I don't know if it's too different. You're just wanting the project to succeed and the company to do well. Um, so, yeah. So you do work more long term in the same code base, though, working for a company internally, right? Right. But I don't think, at, at least for me, I don't bring a different perspective necessarily. Um, I want this thing to succeed even long after I'm gone. Um, so, you know, even though I stay, might stick around a little longer as a non-consultant, um, my actions are sort of still in the best interest I can make them. So you said you got promoted internally at a company. So I'm guessing you were mid or senior level already. And then yep. uh, they saw potential in you, obviously. And then they promoted you to tech lead. I tricked them enough. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Um, they wanted sort of, um, they wanted more of a central voice on each team sort of relating some of the technical aspects or, um, or even helping to make decisions, be they right or wrong. Um, they, the company was just looking for a central technician to reference on each project. Awesome. Sorry, I'm trying to keep up with the chat. Most oh, people saying hi to people right now. Oh, yeah, let's and say hi to them. Yeah. Awesome. So um, part of your roles and responsibilities, because you're running a team, and I know uh, we met sometime last month before COVID and you were kind of talking about your team and the culture and stuff. So that's where I was really interested in what you're doing. So part of your responsibilities, you take part in the hiring and training process. You're of course running the team, you need leadership skills. So I kind of want to touch upon mm -hmm. kind of all of those different facets and mm -hmm. how you've grown and learned to um, kind of become you know, what you are today, a, a technical lead and how you're still, you know, learning and what things you're trying to get better at. So I want to start off with kind of the beginning when you're first hiring or onboarding new developers. Um, so when you're first looking for new developers, mm -hmm. and I know, I think you hire a lot of specifically junior developers. So how do you ensure, and I guess this this goes for any developer you're hiring. Um, how, how can you see when you're interviewing someone if they're going to be a good culture and team fit? Like what kind of things do you look for? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so you don't know, it's a guess. I would like to say that maybe that's just my perspective, but yeah. I think the tech industry is, there's plenty of platforms where you might try to go code and we see, oh, can they code? Um, we have to take behavioral tests. We take all kinds of tests. But at the end of the day, yeah. even for people like Google, this is just the best guess. You know, yeah. they're, they're taking a guess about you. You're taking a guess about them. 
I find that what works for me is to work with people during the interview. So I like talking with them. I like having a normal discussion. I like pairing. I like to pair together and see how they think. And I don't like it when I'm taking a technical test and someone asks me a question and doesn't say whether something's right or wrong. I tend to like when a debate happens or a discussion, I might ask, what is the single responsibility principle? And they'll say, it's one thing in a code base that does one thing. And I'll say, well, how do you know it's one thing? You know, and we'll have a back and forth. And if I think they're wrong, I'll say that I think you're wrong for these reasons, because part of working together is having disagreements and discourse. That's so what true. we try to do is, aside from thinking about, is it a Java de dev? I'm working in C Sharp right now. Is it a C Sharp dev? Is it a JavaScript? Do you know this framework, this technology? I'm more looking for people who are good engineers and good critical thinkers. Um, but yeah, I find that there's no better way to know what it would like to be to work with someone than to do a little bit of work with them. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Because you're almost trying to create an environment similar to work to see how they'll really behave, even creating uh, potentially disagreeable situations to see how they can, you know, if they're able to, you know, have a disagreement and say, you know, I think this way, you think that way, but it's okay for us mm -hmm. to think differently. We can still work together. That's, that's a really good idea, actually. Right. And the more that you do that kind of thing, like um, the more value you get from people's different perspectives versus if you just kind of go in and hope that they think like you do. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So you can get a lot of different people on the team. And that's one problem that I've heard from hiring managers before is that teams are often very homogenous because they hire mm -hmm. people like them. Exactly. So, so you have to kind of, like you said, go out of your way to make sure you're getting a diverse team, So, which will actually make your team much better. Yeah, diversity is one of the main principles of the uh, of extreme programming, which is kind of a framework for Agile that uh, Kent Beck came up with. But diversity is not limited to our, our genders or our skin colors. It's, it's the way we think and our backgrounds. Yeah, there's all different types of you know, physical diversity, mental diversity. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So I don't know, I guess now that I think about the order of these questions, this might oh. be going back a step, um, but it kind of fits into the whole hiring process. So if someone is a brand new developer, this is something that I've been asked a lot, so I'm interested in your take. Um, how do you know if their skills are ready for their first job what kinds of things do you look for to make sure that as a junior brand new developer who's never worked as a professional developer before how do you know that they're going to be able to onboard and do the job um and handle it? yeah good question once again we don't know we're taking guesses about each other um but i don't know if i even necessarily look for that i look for someone who's able to cope with change and able to learn things um just because someone has been doing development for 20 years doesn't mean they didn't experience the same day for those 20 years. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that someone who has a lot of years of experience doesn't have things that are valuable to say. They definitely do. But I believe it's on an equal level as anyone else on the team. So I look for more systematic ways of improving the team and for people to get involved. Things like pair programming, mob programming, um, I'm also a big advocate of tester and development, which helps in my experience, helps newer developers, um, write small bits of functionality that have been falsified, at least under X, X and Y conditions. Um, so even if they can't get all the way there, they can get part of the way there. And does that sort of answer it? Yeah, I think so. Um, basically Lots of pairing. you're looking for someone who's able to cope and, uh, with change and learn new things. I think you have to have a, you know, a base level of technical ability, obviously, just sure. even to be able to cope and understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Once you have that base technical ability, 
you know, if you've also developed critical thinking skills as you've learned to code, you'll be able to ask kind of the right questions mm -hmm. and pick things up, even if they're going over things that you don't really know about yet in the interview process. Yeah. And um, like here, this would be a good example, like um, of a, a good interview, like we're talking and you think someone needs a base level. And I agree. I, I don't think that's nearly as important, but um, I do believe that a bad system will beat a good person every time. And likewise, a good person, even if we hire, you know, someone who's just incredible, if there's a bad system around them, it'll defeat them on day one. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's say you hire a good person in your good system. I'm going to say there's no such thing as a good or bad. That's just my perspective, but go ahead. Okay. Um, so what does your onboarding process look like? I'm sure you've given some thought to this. Yeah. For new developers. Um, well, first off, because of we invest a lot in automation, we have a unit test suite followed by an integration test, followed by acceptance and other forms of testing. It's pretty quick for someone to pick something up and to find what a certain thing does. Mm -hmm. You know, we use we use BDD so that you can say, oh, that's that feature. Oh, OK, I, see, I understand why that that exists. Um, Could you explain what BDD is to everyone? It's behavior driven development. It's mm -hmm. a way of sort of bridging the gap between community um, development you know, or, or tech people and non-tech people, maybe your product owner wants to take part in specifying what the software should do. It's a way of using a subset of your natural spoken language to define tests, which has all these other benefits. But um, so we have that sort of automation suite. So if someone breaks something, no problem, it should be caught. Um, on top of that, we do a lot of pairing. We do a lot of mobbing. Um, so getting someone up to speed is the same as just involving them in activities already going on. Okay. So you already kind of have processes of onboarding already built into your regular development processes. Yeah, we're, we're already there. We're all talking on a regular basis. We're all working together on a regular basis. And because of that, onboarding becomes a little less of an event, if that makes any sense. That's, that's good. Um, one question I would have then is usually when you're hiring, especially newer developers, mm -hmm. uh, they really need some kind of mentorship. Some people get it from places outside of work, you know, either paid or through people in their community. Or uh, I think some of the best companies I've ever seen have really good internal mentorship programs that they're always trying to improve. Do you do anything like that? Yeah, um, I recommend books. I recommend all sorts of resources, but inside our team, we do a lot of mob programming, a lot of pair programming. And so sometimes say we have, or let's not even think about their levels or, or years of experience. Imagine we have a strong back ender and a strong front ender. Um, maybe one's wanting to learn the other technology. Well, mm -hmm. put them together, have them talk and um, something, something good starts to happen. You know, the other person starts to learn the language of the other person and um, and picking up new tech and new skills and your team has less risk now because more people can understand certain parts of the system or maybe even make improvements that someone who had too much context before didn't realize. Um, so that's something that we do. Um, I end up helping quite a bit because I want to be involved with people. I want to manage, but I also want to be on the front lines with them, understanding what they're going through on a daily basis. You know, so, so yeah. Um, I don't think you're necessarily in a good company if lunch is the only time you're allowed to learn something. Okay, so you have a, kind of your mentorship built in as well. Mm -hmm. So one other question I want to ask you uh, kind of about the hiring and training process sure. before we get to a question in the chat. Um, it's basically now, and I'm sure you know what's going on in the industry right now. Um, it's really, really easy for developers to go to a new company, even juniors after they work a year, you know, you can go work almost anywhere as long as you've been developing your skills and portfolio and interview skills. 
So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of exciting projects going on in the mm -hmm. world. They're tempting packages. You know, as a junior, you get hired at a base salary, but after a year, you can pretty much get a mid-level salary a lot of times. So how, how do you retain talent? Like as the leader of a development team, you know, it's costly to have to onboard new members and const have that constant overturn. It's not good for the team. So how do you, have you uh, implemented systems or have you discovered ways of kind of retaining talent, especially in the market right now? That's a great question. Um, I'm not able to do certain things like I can't give a pay increase. Yeah. Um, and the market's very competitive. And so if someone's wanting to go for a salary, may, there might not be much I can do. Um, however, there are other reasons that people stay in work. Um, Malcolm yeah. Gladwell, the guy who runs or wrote the book, uh, The Tipping Point, says, I, I might be misquoting, um, but he says, meaningful work consists of three things. A, comp uh, a direct correlation between success and effort, complexity and autonomy. And so, mm -hmm. so if people have those things, if they can, uh, if they have autonomy, they can see themselves in their work, they're more likely to stick around. If there's complexity, meaning if they're solving a problem instead of by rote cranking out the same solution all the time, that can be meaningful, as well as finding some way of translating the amount of effort that they put in to the amount of success they get out and the amount of satisfaction they get out. Um, that's a little more nuanced and involves a lot about that individual, what they would deem as success maybe. Yeah. So, and I hate to bring it back up again, but this is why I love working together, pairing, mobbing. I know more about what motivates them if, if we're all working together on the same things. And but at the same time, if someone's not happy, there's there might be some only so much that you can do, especially if it's salary related. And um, and of course, if anyone ever did leave, I would wish them well, you know. Yeah. And miss them. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, what you were just talking about leads into our next section. But real quick, I want to take one question from the chat and I'm going to explain this based off of what I think he's asking. OK. Um, so Oscar says, what do you recommend to learn new tech stuff quickly? So I think this is a, a meta question, I think. It's like learning about learning. Mm -hmm. Like how do you pick up new technologies quickly? Gwen may not like this. I don't know. <laughs> I advocate writing learning tests, writing, writing tests because Imagine you're wanting to use a library. Maybe it's an HTML replacement library. Write a few tests, write some learning tests, check them into your repo and say, I think it does this and write an assertion about the test. Run the test, you'll get feedback very quickly. I find that my ability to learn um, things quickly or slowly is related to how fast or slow I get feedback about my assumptions. So, I would just optimize for feedback. And the best way I've found is with small unit tests or if possible, larger larger tests too. Thanks for the comment, Gwen. <laughs> oh, you read it already? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, Jake's recommendation is that you should start with testing. It helps yep. you learn. Yeah, this is the comment Jake is referring to, so. <laughs> Do you have any uh, advice on that, Gwen? I mean, uh, on Oscar's question. Um, I've actually been thinking about this because of, uh, you know, teaching at coding schools, how do people learn? And <laughs> this is kind of a pitch, but uh, I am working on a Python course that I'm launching. And so I've really been trying to figure out based off of my past experience, you know, how do people, how can people best learn not just a programming language, but how to program in general and learn critical thinking skills? Um, and I've come up with some processes. I'm going to write a longer article about this. As I launched the course, I've been writing down a lot of notes. But I think a, co a combination of 
So I have this process. So I do a broad overview and try to get as many like high level details about a new technology as possible. And then I kind of figure out, you know, oh, the, these are the pros and the cons and the features and benefits, all those things. I try to write them out. And then I, I dive in deeper and I try to start building stuff and I take an incremental model, I guess. Um, so I'll build something really simple and then call it the MVP and then start adding more features as I go along to learn a new technology. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I have I have a lot of notes that I've flushed out um, over the last year or so. So I'll be talking more about that later. Well, with all you do with education, you might know even more about it than I would. Um, I just write a few tests to know. I want to know as little about it as I have to. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't making fun of you. About oh, no, you're thing. fine. I, just, I know you're a big uh, testing TDD advocate. And yeah, it's a, it's a really good habit. And I think now that you work for internally for companies versus consulting, that's probably one of the benefits is that you have time and you kind of have the say to implement those systems and do all the testing you want now. Yeah, right. I mean, I, that it came out wrong. I mean, yeah, that's right. But it's kind of like a hill I'm willing to die on either way. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, Bobby Diaz, who's my social media manager, uh, asked a question I'm going to put up on the screen. She cool. said, what are some of the main challenges you face during the hiring process? Right now, the market is just so hot. Um, people have a lot of options. And so yeah. um, hiring is tilted in the favor of the engineer at the moment, um, yeah. which is great for us, right? <laughs> um, but uh, finding people, uh, finding candidates can be a little difficult at this moment. Um, fortunately, I'm not involved in that recruitment process, but... By the time they reach um, the level where I'm sort of having an interview, it's taken work to get them there. And so I need to have respect for the recruiter's time, you know, and for the people who came before me in the process. So do you, do you actually reach out to candidates yourself? No. no. So you, you get them in the pipeline already. Mm-hmm. And if you think they're good, you try to make it as enticing as possible and show them all the good parts of the company. Um, yeah, and I just try to see the good in, in, in the person. Not everyone creates value in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes when we put metrics on each other, you know, um, we might not be measuring the right things. Um, some individuals contribute in vastly different ways. So... So trying not to apply like a, um, a too focused lens on the individual, not trying to make them into somebody that I already know, um, and rather trying to see them as what value can they contribute and how can that grow? That's interesting. Um, so I, we have a couple more questions. One of them relates to hiring. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this one up first. Uh, so uh, this is from LexiCode. Lexicode Studio. So are other methods outside practical coding session to test a good developer before hiring? Yeah. Um, and thank you for the quotes. We, we, we don't want to say good developer, bad developer. It could also be an off day for that individual. Yeah. Um, or they could just not be good at interviewing. Yeah. I mean, people have all kinds of nerves. I know that I do for sure. Um, yeah, I find that sometimes just talking things out is good. Sometimes people are really good in the system design, but kind of fall off during a coding test or um, or even the other way around. Nerves play a big part in it. A lot of times people are trying to do their best. And in doing their best, they become maybe too sales salesperson-y. And I have trouble seeing who they are. So I try to ask questions that might expose the reality of their understanding. Um, one question I like to ask is what is what is a computer? As silly as that may sound, some people talk about the different chips and the different kind of computer architectures. Some don't even talk about anything electronical. Um, 
And sometimes it's enough to throw someone completely off. It doesn't mean they're good or bad. It's just something I try to do to open the conversation up to get to know them. Mm. And see um, how they think. Yeah. I yeah. think that's interesting because it's not a, it's not an answer they would have memorized. Like a, there are so many lists of common interview questions. So a lot of people memorize, you know, the answers or know how to solve, you know, tree problems or whatever kind of problems you give them. Mm -hmm. but if you're asking them different kinds of questions like that, just to see how they think, you know, it really makes them stop and, you know, give maybe more of an honest answer that they haven't like prepared for. Yeah. And credit to Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. That's that's not my question. <laughs> so uh, I forgot to credit him before. But yeah, oh, okay. um, just anything like that. Um, and if they bring up something that you find, you know, it's one thing to sort of have your list of questions, but if you find them going off on a tangent that you find interesting, go there with them. Maybe they know something about something that you don't know. Um, which would indicate maybe that they can learn about your thing. Awesome. So I want to, we've already spent 30 minutes. Oh, Didn't feel like 30 good. minutes at all. So uh, I want to kind of move on to running a team. So sure. basically, well, how long have you been a tech lead so far? Going on a year about maybe um, nine months, 10 months. Okay. Something like that. So You've had some experience managing a team, mm -hmm. let's say a year. So to successfully manage your team, you've had to interact with all these different people. And the thing about people is that they each have their own personality. Everyone has their own personality. So you still have to get them to work together as one cohesive unit because you have certain features that you have to ship according to deadlines and that kind of stuff. So how have you learned to kind of accommodate and work with all these different types of people and personalities? Have you implemented systems or learned methodologies to do that? Um, good question. Um, the Agile Manifesto has one of their, their big like value things that they mm -hmm. say, we individual individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I. I've never liked being in a place where they try to replace the interactions and the individuals with processes and tooling. Um, it seems demoralizing. It makes, it makes me sad when I see people being too rigid about anything without regards for maybe how a human feels. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, I don't, I, I think it's something I'm still learning is how to work with different individuals. Um, I don't, I think it might be an illusion that there's any such thing in life as, or such thing in people as normal. Um, so I try to talk with them frequently. You know, we work on things together. We, uh, sometimes I am the driver in the pair programming sessions and I have them navigate me. Sometimes I'm the navigator and, you know, they're the driver. Um, Sometimes if I'm, if it's not going well, I'll try something different because worst case scenario, at least you're trying a different direction. Like sometimes if I'm communicating too weakly, I'll try communicating strongly or I'll, I'll try to switch it around sometimes. Um, and pairing is a great way of doing that and understanding how the individual thinks. And what's nice about that too, is we start to pick up on the common language of each other. So imagine I say, I think you need a strategy pattern there or something like that. And then they might go, oh, like this. And they go and they type it up. Or maybe it's an opportunity where they say, I don't know strategy pattern. And so it's a chance for us to learn something together. And then the next time we encounter that, we're going to go faster. So sort of prioritizing learning, prioritizing communication, trying different things when it's not working. I can't say it's too different from talking yeah. on a regular basis, you know? It's interesting. I was watching a psychology video the other day because I'm also trying to improve my interpersonal skills. You're great. Um, <laughs> thank you. So yeah. basically it was interesting because she was the psychologist. Um, I can't remember her name, but she was explaining how to interact with different types of people to make them feel comfortable. Like mm. people who are very shy and withdrawn don't want you to ask a lot of questions, but you should talk about something of mutual interest. 
So that's where maybe pair programming would be good because you're both, you know, working on something mutual and talking about that same thing. And that makes that person open up more to you. Oh, totally. where, whereas someone who likes to talk a lot is very outgoing. They want to answer lots of questions. They love to talk. So you have yeah. to kind of gauge the person, see where they're at uh, on the spectrum, what style of communication they prefer. So I've been trying to look at that more in people. Was that the Satir interaction model that you're learning? I'm not sure. I'm not uh, that knowledgeable about the titles, I guess. Okay. Well, I was just curious. There's this um, family psychologist. I don't know from what era, and I don't know much about psychology, but it's called the Satir interaction model. And it's something about, I, there's like four different phases. There's the information. That's the thing I'm saying to you. And then there's the meaning. You're going to attribute meaning to that. And then I forget what the next step is called, but you're going to add feelings and connotations to that. And then after all that is said and done, you're going to respond. But most of that is informed by your past experiences in your life, most of which I've had nothing to do with. So um, I, I found that to be a helpful model in, in, in talking to people. Um, but it's I'll have like, to look it up. Yeah, it's something I'm still learning, so I don't know much about it yet. But um, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, that sounds I, much I, much deeper than what I was talking about. Oh no, you're fine. Yeah. I, I I find that you you learn a lot of tech stuff as a developer, and then after a while, it just becomes like your your bookshelves are just filled with applied psychology. After that, <laughs> I I feel like that too. Like I've spent the last seven years reading documentation tech manuals and now I'm reading like leadership skills, interpersonal skills. I find myself reading those types of things, you know, more. Mm. It's it's changed from like 90, 10 to now it's like 75% those kind of soft skills, 25% oh, nice. tech. Maybe it's 50, 50 sometimes, but. Well, your soft yeah. skills are top notch. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. You're doing good. <laughs> So, um, uh, yeah, so I guess the next topic uh, is meetings, everybody's favorite thing as a developer. So um, usually as a team lead, and I'm guessing you have to do this too, is run meetings. Do you have to run meetings at your company? Sometimes. Um, as much as possible, I just try to eliminate and, you know, protect folks from meetings. <laughs> protect folks. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so more, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you did, cause then there's some follow up. So basically how do you, I guess, do you have uh, implement or how have you implemented your team meetings? Have you found certain meetings that have worked well for your team? Cause I know with agile, there's like retros, there's all these different meetings and, you know, everyone implements agile differently or, you know, whatever system you've implemented, but for each team, it seems like they've, they have unique ways of meeting that work for that team. So what, what have you found in your experience works well? Um, no, that's a great question. Um, once again, I don't find that replacing in individuals and interactions with processes and tools is that great of an idea. I'm, it may not be a secret to anyone who knows me. I'm not a huge fan of Scrum. Um, that's not to say it can't work on its own. Like the retrospective thing, for instance, if you're already mobbing and you're already pair programming together, mm -hmm. there's nothing saying that you can't talk about that regularly, more regularly, as, as often as you want. Like after you make a test pass, you could say, could we have used an editor shortcut to make that happen a little faster? Or could we have done that refactoring mm. a little bit better? So kind of more instantaneous feedback yeah. and changes. That's interesting. Yeah. And I, I mean, the, the meetings are a form of integrating ideas and, and ways of people talking, but integrating is painful in proportion to how infrequently you do it, how much you have to integrate and how many people have different ideas they want to integrate. Um, so I find that doing that as frequently as possible makes it as pleasant as it can be. Um, 
I've been to retros where it's more like blame storming, oh, in yeah. which case I just kind of turn off my mic and turn it into coffee time. But um, yeah, I think that happens sometimes with inexperienced leaders. Who's ever running the meeting is mm. inexperienced at running a metro, uh, a retro properly. A metro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm visiting Boston next week. So I've been looking at train schedules. So maybe I'm getting my words mixed up. I'm jealous. <laughs> You're jealous of going to New England, one of the coldest places in America in the, in January. Hey, I'm in Indiana in January. I'm jealous of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to um, meetings. So, sorry I interrupted you. No, no, no. I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, me too. So, I guess, oh, we were talking about retros. And then, so what meetings do you have then? Do you just have impromptu meetings or do you have anything regularly scheduled? We have less and less. Um, a while ago, we had regular architecture, regular tech alignment, regular mm. um, data team meetings and things like this. And what we found is that in integrating more often with the people who are needed to integrate tends to make these things non-events. That tends to make them simple discussions that don't even need a meeting. Um, it kind of it's kind of similar to the software principle of cohesion. Like, if these two things need to work together, like, let's, and they always change together, let's move them closer together. Um, the same can be said of people. Imagine the whole DevOps movement as we don't want to chuck our code over the wall anymore, and then have yeah. meetings and emails back and forth. Let's let's find ways of enabling people um, to work more closely together. Right, like whatever is needed for the project to succeed, let's apply the whole team approach and bring those things closer together. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we see that, but honestly, we kind of look at too many meetings as a smell in our project design. <laughs> yeah, okay. That just reminded me of, of a quote, uh, comments are deodorant for code smells <laughs> when you see lots of comments. That's true. <laughs> Anyway, so meetings are deodorant for company smells. Ooh, maybe. I kind of like that. <laughs> You're going to put it up on your wall now. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, that might be my first quote. That's cool. All right. So fewer and fewer meetings. Actually, that's something that I've really enjoyed about the company that I just joined last oh, month. Nice. Is we don't have any meetings without a specific purpose. So if we have a regular scheduled meeting and there's nothing to talk about, we just don't have that meeting. Yeah. So we don't have standups. We don't have, you know, any of those type of things, but we do end up meeting, um, you know, se at least several times a week because we have things to talk about. Yeah. We're talking about uh, new features or projects or, uh, someone has a question of someone else and we'll just have an impromptu meeting. So mm -hmm. I, I've kind of really enjoyed that system because it feels like uh, it's way more productive than having this meeting that people are dreading. And I've just, I've found you get m way more out of it. And then oh, also, yeah. sorry, I'm taking over. No, no, no. I'm, I'm really liking what you're saying. <laughs> There's um, but standups too. I found at a lot of companies uh, people will have standups in the morning and people have already forgotten what they've done the day before, or they'll just say something and nobody else is really listening because it doesn't pertain to them. And it's hard to remember what everyone is saying if they're just verbally uh, saying it, you know, out loud. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've found, you know, asynchronous standups or no standups work much better than that usually. I, I personally like the no stand up thing. If we're all working together anyway and we're all talking, um, then we're kind of already doing that, you know? Yeah. And if you're blocked on something, there's no reason why I have to say it in a stand up or, you know, like wait for stand up to get unblocked. Like there should be some kind of other system in mm. place where if someone is blocked for a certain amount of time, you know, what should they do? There should be some kind of action. Yeah, exactly. Like the, Every time there's there's a, a handoff, there's a queue. And if you're waiting for Sprint uh, stand up to um, express these things, these blockers or whatever, um, you're going to have longer wait times. Yeah. Nobody's. 
Okay, so real quick, uh, someone asked, so in terms of a meeting, is a 10 minute stand up in the morning good or bad? What's your opinion? I can't answer that. It's it's up to you in your context. And, you know, yeah. maybe Gwen, maybe you have more to say about it. Yeah, I mean, it does depend on the team and what you like. Um, but I have found that, you know, switching to at least an async stand up every day is much more thoughtful because people can write out in Slack or whatever app uh, exactly what they've done that day, mm -hmm. you know, what they're planning on doing. And then everyone at any time throughout the day, even if they miss stand up, can look through. And if they need some information, you know, what someone else is working on. And it gives a good record of what someone was working on every day. So if you're questioning whether or not the morning meetup is useful or as you put it, good or bad, then you know, asynchronous standups, getting an async standup bot in your in your chat app or whatever might be a good thing to look at. All right. So, but yeah, it's not necessarily good or bad. I think if it's 10 minutes that involves maybe six people on your team or however big your team is, and if nobody needed that, that's probably a bad thing. Um, it's an hour out of the day from your team who could otherwise be productive. Yeah. And I've heard from some devs that if there's, let's say the they start work at, at nine, at nine, they're <laughs> actually ready to work by 930 at their desk and everything. But mm -hmm. then they have a stand up meeting at 10 so they can't really get into any deep work so they waste that 30 minutes mm -hmm. and then they have the stand up for 15 minutes and then they actually don't start work until 10 30 uh even though yeah. they got there at nine so it does kind of um break up the day in a way that you can't start focused work in the morning and some people you know people get their most focused work in at different times. Some people really get that focused work in in the morning. Mm -hmm. so if you're taking that away from someone, you might be making your developers less productive without even realizing it. But you have to kind of gauge how, you know, people on your team best work to decide if that's worth it. Yeah, I want to echo what you're saying. Um, there's a great book by Uncle Bob, uh, Robert Martin, if anybody yeah. doesn't know Uncle Bob, and he's got this whole clean series, clean code, mm. clean architecture. The one I want to talk about is called Clean Coder. It's a book about professional um, behavior for a developer. And one of the things he says in the book is if you're going to go to a meeting that doesn't help the company or help your productivity, you're in fact being unprofessional. It's perfectly professional to excuse yourself and get out of there and um, and get on with your, your, your day. I like how much you quote books. I can tell you study and really try to learn a lot. I don't know anything on my own. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Everything we know as developers came from so many other people and resources. It's like we all kind of build off of each other. Mm -hmm. Totally. That's a good way to word it. So last question about meetings. So do you have a process for one-on-ones or progress review meetings with the people on your team? How do you handle those? Not really. We do so much pairing and mobbing that, um, that we don't do that. Um, I'm also very distrustful of authority. And so as I'm starting to fall into a, p a position that may have a bit of the smallest bit of authority, I don't want to breed mistrust. And I've often found one-on-ones unproductive mm -hmm. and uninteresting. I would rather Just be, for you personally? Just like for me personally. Um, I think, I think if people feel disconnected from the people who manage them, then a one-on-one -on -one might be a good way to reconnect. But for me, I've always found it a way for, it's like management checking off a box in my opinion. And um, so that's my opinion. I'm not right. Um, I, I, I really believe that it's better just to work together to talk about the work. And then we sort of have a better idea about each other. And by proxy, personal things come up sometimes too. Someone says, oh, I'm not able to do this right now because I'm dealing with this situation with mm. my dog or something. And then whatever would have come out in the one-on-one -on -one comes out during the time when we're actually doing work together. Um, other than that, I kind of feel like one-on-ones are just a sort of startup feel goodery sort of thing. But that's just my impression. I don't, I, I don't know all the management behind it. But 
it's just that's just me yeah if you have a different opinion about one-on-ones maybe you can leave us a comment yeah. or post in chat and let us know your thoughts um okay so i'm gonna inject this question now it was actually asked earlier mm -hmm. but i didn't think it didn't really fit in the hiring section so i'm gonna inject it here real quick it's 150 uh our time do you have oh, more okay. time how much time do you have? i can go a little longer Okay, good, because we're cool. going to go a little over. That's all, all right. good. Let's see. Uh, oh, where did it go? Oh, here we go. Uh, Cristiano's question. He's asking for tips to organize yourself to not forget so many things that a tech lead needs to deal with. Um, yeah, I, I keep a running to-do list throughout the day. Um, I don't get to everything, but... I try to organize it like higher priority at the top, lower priority at the bottom. Um, Do you have any system like getting things done or? Um, I try to enable partial completion for the people on my team and for myself. So like imagine that we have some sort of like load testing requirement or something. Well, do we need to load test all the things all at once? Probably not. So if that's high priority, we could totally just do something, you know, one end point to start with or something like that. Um, for me, I try to protect my time a lot. Um, I try to build in Slack every day on my calendar. I have an hour of learning straight in the morning. I just say, this is my learning time. And um, that's cool. Yeah, it's not the only time I learn for sure. But um, by blocking things off, it does help defend me a little bit. Um, I don't use that time for other things though. It's just, it's just definite time that's not messed with. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it can be hard. And honestly, sometimes by prioritizing and writing a to-do list, things just keep moving to the bottom. And I realize maybe that's not a priority. And yeah. um, it's, it's okay to drop things, I think, you know? So that's the best I got. Yeah, that's interesting because I was reading a book recently. I can't remember which book it was. I'm not as good as you as remembering quotes and which book. But they were saying that um, libraries in certain places have had uh, very good luck. Um, basically, they take the last books that were checked out, and before they sort them and put them back on the correct shelf, they just leave all of those books open to browse at kind of the entryway. Oh, wow. Because the last thing that someone else checked out is probably the first thing that someone else is going to want they've found. Mm. So it's it's very interesting. So actually, I started organizing because I use the getting things done method. Mm -hmm. And I still use the Nirvana HQ uh, task tracking app. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have a list of all the projects I'm working on. And so every time I work on a task or a project, I drag that one to the top. Mm -hmm. And I found that the stuff that floats to the top is the most important stuff. And then the rest. So I kind of naturally filter out tasks that aren't as important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's the whole quadrants like important and urgent. The Eisenhower and matrix. Yeah. yeah. Not urgent, not important. So I found mm -hmm. that that's a really good way to naturally filter out tasks. And I love talking about productivity, but I don't want to no, that's great. It too much. And that, that honestly comes down to a software principle. Like not everything has the same level of volatility. So you want to organize things that change together at the same time. So that's pretty smart. Another uh, thing that has really helped me is turn other people into leaders too. Mm -hmm. Like bring other people to meetings that would previously have been just a, a you meeting, you know, and let them deal with it trust them you know um let them make mistakes um you know there most mistakes are acceptable there's very few that are not and if you can trust other people to help get things done then there's not this everything waiting on jake constraint you know yeah um, if i if i don't trust people and if i put too much on my shoulders i've forced everyone to turn or i've i've, I've turned myself into a constraint and a bottleneck and I've overwhelmed myself and that doesn't make me happy, you know? So, um, enabling others is important. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say oh, that kind of builds off of what you said earlier, 
when you mentioned Mac- Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, giving people autonomy, mm-hmm. um, which also makes them feel like they're doing more meaningful work and happier at work as well. It makes you happier too. So. Yeah, so exactly. For everyone. You're, you're all growing this thing together and it's kind of beautiful if, if everyone sees a bit of themselves in it, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Real quick, I want to give a shout out to Real Tough Candy. I don't know if you watch her channel, Jake. I don't. She, she's another YouTuber. Subscribe. Yeah. And she does, I, I think I found her um, making reviews on Udemy courses and those kind of courses because, you know, we all have bought in the past yeah. a lot of those kind of courses. So she does those, but she has a lot of other cool content too. And I actually did an interview on her channel once talking about Vue.js. So oh, nice. Yeah. I think that that was a really good interview. She's fun to talk to. So well, cool. yeah, I'm thanks. glad to meet new people. Yeah, thanks for joining the stream, Candy. All right, so I'm trying to look through the comments. Oh, someone did have a comment. Sure. I really want to get to prayer programming. Someone has a comment okay. about um, stand-ups. So they said, I think a bigger issue with stand-ups is that we take turns talking about our code, but none of us pays much attention because we're focused on being ready to talk about our code. Yes, that is one of the issues with, you know, synchronous stand-up where you're all talking because I am, I know because I've been in there and I am thinking this whole circle, everyone's going around and the whole time I'm thinking like, these are the points I'm going to make. These are the points I'm going to make. And they're going over and over in my head. So I haven't heard anything anyone else has said. So yeah, that's a real a really good point. The simulator concierge. So um, I think that's another argument for you know switching to asynchronous standups. Awesome. It may also be an op- argument for dropping it because if people aren't going to listen to each other, what's the point? Um, I think it kind of goes back to communicating. When you're listening to someone, are you thinking about what you want to say? I mean, we all do that on some level, but or are you listening? Um, I'm half and half. I'm, I'm getting better. Yeah. I've had a, a really hard time with that, but I'm getting better too. So we're like on the same trajectory, Jake. I hope so. <laughs> I hope I'm on your trajectory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I'll be on your testing trajectory one day and write really awesome tests. It's just cause I can't remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what I've found is, Man, it's just so easy to talk to you. Uh, oh, what, I've, what I've found is that testing is, if if someone has good tests going into a project, that is like the best thing in the world. It's like, yes, I can see exactly how I should interact with this code base because someone has this awesome test suite and this is the API. This is how I should interact with it. This is what, you know, where I should see these types of errors and edge cases and stuff, you know. And yeah. in Python, um, you know, we use doc strings to kind of explain methods, um, classes, and modules. So if they have some good doc strings written, you know, of course, good naming conventions, good test suite, it's like the most ideal thing to uh, onboard into a new code base. I, I definitely like it because um, for me, test-driven development, writing the test first has been a, a game changer. Um, I start by saying what the thing should do, and then I make the test pass. Um, it, I never, I always thought I was a good developer before I started practicing tester and development. It's been a few years I've been practicing it now. Um, and I'm always finding ways for my software to improve its design now. Um, awesome. but yeah, when, when you have a beautiful test, not just one that validates a, a functionality, <laughs> but one that's one line of range, one line act, one line of cert. Then it, and with a clear name, like it does this for this reason, you know, I mean, don't use that. That's a terrible name, but um, you know, it, it does this if this is true or something. I don't know. Um, uh, it, it just, yeah, it's so helpful when you go back in the code because the next person working with it may be you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I found that with a consulting project, you know, now I work internally for a company, but you know, I was doing consulting and sometimes you're pressured to really push out an app quickly. And then I'd go back and try to make updates to this app that I had done. I'm like, man, I really wish I had written 
more tests and written, uh, you know, better outlined what this does, written better mm -hmm. documentation, stuff like that. I, I have yet to see evidence that um, when a company thinks that, okay, we can, we can do without testing, you know, um, I have yet to see evidence that that does make you go faster. And people say this all the time about pair programming. Well, now that's inefficient. You have two pair, you have two programmers working together. You know, I'd rather you guys work separately. Um, I have yet to see evidence that that's more efficient. Um, yeah. I get I my, think it depends on the person for yeah. pair programming, which is actually the next thing I wanted to talk okay, about. Go for it. So thanks. Um, yeah. So I'll have to have you back on for talking oh, about DD trying. and testing because there's so much we can talk about there. It's my but, favorite thing. Yeah. So uh, what are you, so basically I'm going to give a, a little bit of a backstory. So at um, this company that I'm working for, uh, we've basically had this discussion, I think a few weeks ago, and we were talking about, should we implement pair programming on a schedule? Should it naturally just happen between people? And, you know, different people gave their opinions. Of course, I gave my own opinion. And I was thinking about, you know, what's your opinion and how have you implemented this? Because I know you're very uh, strong and adamant on pair programming. So do you, is it something you schedule or mandate or does it naturally happen on your team and you just encourage it? How do you handle that? Yeah, so um, I'm actually not strong in it, and um, I, there's no sort of mandate. Um, if people want to go leave and, and kind of do their thing, that's okay. Um, but it has some downsides. And um, the more we learn about pairing, the more it naturally sort of happens on our team. Um, we all think that we're going to work faster when we're at a higher utilization. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to be busy is the traditional yeah. way of thinking about things. But when everyone's busy, then you spend time waiting for a code review. Or if you don't do code review, maybe you spend time waiting for an environment or you spend time waiting for... There's always some limiting resource because all of the other resources are currently busy. Um, or maybe waiting for product validation, whatever your case may be. If you focus on utilization, you are not focusing on throughput. Um, so by pair programming, you actually end up forcing people to take a little bit of slack um, because now the task, you don't have two tasks that are completely utilizing someone's time. So each line is actually getting reviewed as it's being written. And That's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of a more ideal code review so that by the time it gets to code review, it's like a non-event. And I'm also a strong believer in mob programming, though I'm learning more about it. I would really dream of having a customer sit on the team with us, with whoever is needed to complete the feature. And we just work through the feature until it's done, pick up the next one. Um, otherwise, we're sort of in this spot where, well, I wrote my code and then a tester says, well, I'm, you know, I'm trying to test it. So I don't know. I think in a system, things are held back by queues, loops, and defects. Queues being wait times, you try to minimize wait times with things like pair programming loops would be like, okay, I've pitched up my code, but the testers said that that wasn't the right sort of feature set. I didn't do good. So you start all the way back at the beginning and you go through all those cues one more time. Um, if you bring these activities closer together, you end up spending a lot less time in queues, a lot more time writing, working software. So, um, as far as pair programming goes, on my team, I want people to have autonomy. I want them to see themselves in their work. If they want to go off and do something by themselves, that's perfectly fine. And some things it's valid to do. It's not for me to control them or to say, no, it has to be this way. It's, um, you know, it's every, everyone needs to take care of the system. It's not just me. So um, I don't know if that sort of answers it, but... Um, that's kind of what we do is just, it's up, it's up to the people. So it seems like you have just a team that provides the environment where people naturally pair program with each other. We've grown it to be that way because we all come from places where it wasn't that way. Most, most of us don't work together in the software industry. Um, and then we yeah. have these big surprises when, Oh, that feature wasn't the right feature or the, uh, 
you know, this feature is really hard to test or something. But when you start combining the activities that are meaningful, put them closer together, you have less friction. So, yeah. And if you have more eyes on the code, then it ends up being mm. written better in the first place. And that actually is better because a lot of times you're waiting for that code review and then you have to, sometimes you have to go and fix a bunch of things or you find out like it wasn't exactly what we needed, like you said. And then, so you've waited for it and you're already working on something else. And now you have to go back to that and change it. And it's like this asynchronous thing that sometimes takes a while. And by that time your branch has diverged from uh, main or dev or whatever. And then you, you've already, you know, it's just more context switching that's unnecessary. But if you've pair programmed, it's written better from the start, then as you mentioned, it's not like a big deal to get the code review. You can get it knocked out. You've mm -hmm. already had other eyes on it. And then you can just get it merged in and move on with the next task. Yeah, hopefully. And um, it also sort of frees up people if they want to step away from the mob and go learn something about some little detail. Maybe they're poor, maybe you're working with a database expert and their part hasn't come in yet. And they're thinking, oh, I need to go research this. So you're working with a product owner and they have some emails. They can do that. The Slack is built into the work. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I want to take a question here. There's a couple of questions about pair programming real quick. Sure. I don't have water at my desk. <clears throat> I need it trying, too. Yeah, I'm trying not to lose my voice. Mm. Uh, just, and we'll just go a little bit longer. But nobody's, he's been, he's probably my longest subscriber on my YouTube oh, channel. Cool. He's been on most of my streams since I started streaming a couple years ago. So uh, he also, I think he's a team lead. Oh, nice. uh, I don't want to get too much into the specifics, but we talk on, in my Discord chat, and I think he's a team lead at his company. Um, and he is asking, would you recommend pair programming in pairs of people with different experience? Like, do you line them up like junior with senior or different personalities, or how do you pair people? I, I'd say there's no rule. Um, I think we we look for rules as some sort of like, well, you can't let two juniors, but mm. really I've, I've never seen any problem with any groups of people. Um, if they want to be together, then you let them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's no harm in two seniors hopping together too. Um, most of the time people sort of want them, they want to do the best work for the different for, for the thing that they're working on at the time. And if they're sort of over-provisioned, you'll find people kind of naturally break out of those pairs or those mobs or bring in different people into them. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really have any sort of organization, but pairing and mobbing is something I'm still learning how to implement. Um, uh, I will say that one important thing is that people share the keyboard and people share the time. Yeah sort of navigating because sometimes you get people who don't talk as soon as they start typing or you'll get people as soon as they start navigating who don't really navigate. Um, so sometimes I pop in and just check in and say, hey, we need to be talking a bit more. Uh, why don't you pass the keyboard to this person or something? And, or you're passed to me for a second. Tell me what to do, you know, or something. Uh, um, so that just kind try of different things. That kind of leads into the next question because I know you're remote. So when you're talking mm -hmm. about um, pair programming, you're talking about remote. So nobody's is also asking what tools do you use? So for remote pair programming, do you have specific tools that you use to enable that? Um, I think there's a, a lot of tools out there, but so long as you have screen sharing, you're kind of good to go. Um, I think there's a VS Code extension that lets you both type in the same file and that's really helpful. Um, yeah, but really just having someone share their screen and another person saying, okay, we, I think we need a test for this kind of thing. Okay. Let's move on to this or something like that. Or we have some tech debt. Let's do some refactoring can be really helpful. Yeah. I really like VS codes sharing feature. That's and, impressive. Yeah. And you can either do, um, you can screen share it through another program as well while you're both typing mm. or you can, um, use the audio directly through VS Code, which also works really well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, the tools are just going to keep getting better too. 
And I like, like you said, that way they don't have to pass back and forth the keyboard. You know, they both have the opportunity to type, I think as long as it's not in the same line at the same time. But, I think you're right, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question about pair programming. And then I have one more question that I really want to get to, okay. and then we're going to have to do part two. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks, nobodies. So this is Existential Panda. Uh, what kind of data points can you leverage to show your organization the value of pair mob programming? Like, how do you know it's valuable? Well, thanks for that question, Existential Panda. Uh, <laughs> love that name. Um, everything has to be data-driven, right? And um, it's it's sort of um, it's sort of it's sort of important that we try to be scientific and we try to be data-driven as possible, but. The value of this sort of thing would assume a state of statistical control, and we're not always in a state of statistical control, meaning has that is that individual working on their own, doing the exact same feature or of the same complexity in the same context as when they're pairing. So I don't know what the value points would be of comparing those actual data points, even if you got them, um, because oftentimes in development, we're in a state of statistical variation. However, I think it can be appreciated that um, you could calculate the amount of wait time something goes through because of, of not pairing. So for instance, if you're waiting a few days for a code review, that's, that's time that the work item is not flowing. So that's time that your system is not being productive. Yeah. Um, the number of times that something moves back because maybe you didn't involve the right personnel in the task right from the start. like. Um, maybe there was a product owner that should have been involved during the process um, or maybe there was a senior developer that would have been doing the code review um, who could have made it go faster if you guys had just done the task together um, something rework is a great sign of this sort of thing too like oh i reviewed this person's code and it wasn't any good they they forgot this and they forgot mm -hmm. that and so we had to put it back to the start and so we missed our deadline and it's that person's fault and we're developers, we're supposed to be systematic about these things. That's usually a good indicator that what if we had been working together all along? We wouldn't have missed this. Um, otherwise, you just kind of end up blaming the individual. But yeah, Existential Panda, that's what I'd probably go with. Um, wait times are the first uh, sort of project smell. So in all the books that you've read, have you seen anything like actual studies about uh, pair programming or working more closely together or anything? I have yet to see a bunch of studies about this. However, I kind of want to bring up something I said at the start. I have yet to see people prove to me that working at full utilization by ourselves is more productive. Yeah. So I kind of like to pitch that back on them. I've found that pair programming has really helped me. Sometimes it's just to vent. Sometimes I just need to talk out loud with another human. And then suddenly I figure it out and I'm like, man, this, this is so obvious. I just needed to talk to somebody about it. And mm -hmm. then sometimes it is to really technically dive into something and, and ideate or program together. So I think there's a couple different reasons, but I've found it to be really just personally helpful, even if I haven't done some kind of uh, data-driven scientific study about it. I think it's a great question, but um, yeah, but but also it's it's hard to get solid statistics in a state of statistic statistical variation. Yeah. So if you find any evidence, pros or cons, existential panda, then please share it with us. All right. There are a couple more questions, but I am going to jump into the question that I really want to ask. Cool. Uh, so one thing that I've been thinking about of a lot lately, especially I wrote an article a while back about, you know, getting diagnosed with ADHD and then something else. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about accommodations, you know, working from home has been a big thing that has just made me at least five to 10 times more productive and less anxious me and, yeah, and working, <laughs> having a flexible Sorry. schedule. It's okay. You have a much cooler office space. I've been admiring it, by the way. Yours, yours is so nice compared. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's a green screen because it's not as nice. So. Oh, not nicer than a basement? <laughs> <laughs> With guitars. I'm so fancy. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So, you know, I've been um, 
thinking about really what makes me the most productive and happiest and able to output the best quality work that I can. What kinds of things do I need? And I think, you know, accommodations aren't just for people with ADHD or ADHD and uh, related neurological conditions. It could be for anybody. Mm -hmm. So um, have you run into that? Like what kind of accommodations have you had to provide on your team? And have you ever had to, you know, accommodate people for physical or mental differences or health needs? They have to accommodate me. No, I'm just, um, but um, no, I mean, it's kind of like what I was saying earlier. I don't think that there is such a thing as normal. And um, especially developers are sort of, we tend to be a little more introverted. We tend to have more esoteric interests than other people, just from what I've noticed. But that doesn't mean that we're not people. Um, so I think if someone needs space, you give them space. If someone needs involvement, you give them involvement. Um, you try to talk to them, try to talk to them in a way that works for them. I don't do perfect, but, um, and no, we don't have anyone who has, say something as like autism or, or maybe that I don't know about it, you know? Um, but um, it kind of goes back to what I would answer with everything. It's like a soul, it's like a silver bullet work together, you know, talk together, spend time together is better than isolate, judge, evaluate, you know? Yeah. So you give them the opportunity to communicate about their needs and then you can, you know, you also have the opportunity to be responsive to those. Right. And remember, we're, we're all part of a system. There's no good individual that can beat a bad system or bad or, you know, um, good system that will fail because one individual needed space, you know? Yeah. Um, we all need to contribute to the system and the health of this thing. And if, if, the, if something's not working for someone that may be feedback that there's some, something bad in the system that's hurting people, you know, and if it's just one that you notice, it's probably others. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't have any concrete advice for that. I'm, I'm afraid. All right. Yeah, uh, I've worked at a couple of places where I've realized, like, looking back, you know, I should have been asking for certain things. Like, mm. one place would not, I lived across the street from this place. So, mm -hmm. a couple of minutes walk to my house. So, I would, uh, we were supposed to be in the office, but I would sneak out, go back to the house. There was no like VPN requirements or anything. So, it didn't really matter where I worked from. Mm -hmm. But I would go back to the house and do a lot of great work. And then come back to the office and get nothing done because I was like anxious and the room was very uncomfortable and cold. And so I was just thinking like if it was the current, current me, like if I was going back and working in that job, I would have, you know, asked for what I needed to be productive and happy at work. And I, you know, I could have gotten a lot more done, been happier and probably you know, worked there much longer if I had chosen to do so, if I had just asked for, you know, accommodations that were very sensible and reasonable and didn't require any extra work from anyone else. Yeah. So. But also, I mean, um, you, you're just a person. You, you don't always you don't always know that you can ask for the thing. It's not I don't know. Maybe I'm making too gen broad a generalization here, but in American culture, it's common to overwork. It's common to yeah. revere that person who stays later and goes to the office and, you know, goes to the company parties. Um, I, I've benefited greatly too from remote work, and you know, I don't think I have any sort of ADHD or autism. But nevertheless, I don't like driving to the office just to get online. And yeah. um, you know, the things that restore me are here. You know the my wife, my cats, um, <laughs> my chickens, you know, chickens. Yeah. We have eight chickens. Oh, cool. Yeah. We'll bring you some eggs sometime. Um, I actually don't eat eggs. Oh, okay. But okay. I appreciate that you have them. <laughs> okay, cool. I won't bring you eggs. Yeah. Um, wait, I got totally stuck on chickens and now I forgot. Oh, we were it talking happens. about yeah, <laughs> we're talking about accommodations. Yeah, that's something I've just been really interested in because mm -hmm. some people 
think like, oh, it's all about willpower and why do you need accommodations? But actually we have to really consider that the processes that exist in our world, our environments, they just kind of naturally evolved most of the time. And people weren't thinking about what's the best thing for humans mentally and physically to be the healthiest and most productive. So sometimes we have to really uh, like actively think and consider those things. And, you know, over the course of our career, uh, I feel like we're constantly learning like mm. how we best work, how we best interact. And then we can naturally start asking for or requiring those things, especially since it is a developer's market right now. Yeah, and totally. Companies and companies just in general are you know, more aware of mental health, which is a really great thing mm -hmm. that, you know, 10 years ago, it was much more stigmatized than it is today. Like I feel totally comfortable sharing, you know, if I got this diagnosis and asking for accommodations, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think there's a hashtag going around on uh, Twitter called tech safety. And it's, if I remember mm -hmm. right, it's the idea that just like there used to be industrial controls, like there's, um, what's it called? OSHA. If you ever work in a, a warehouse, yeah. there's all these different things. Well, the same should apply to tech workers, even though it's mostly not a box falling us that, on us that we have to worry about. Um, there's a severe drain that can happen. There's a severe um, burnout can happen. Yeah. Um, we go through things, even if it doesn't, you know, outwardly look like we experience any sort of damages. I think burnout's pretty common in the uh, software industry. Yeah, mental burnout. I've experienced it unlike any other job I've ever oh, had yeah. previously. Oh, yeah, it's, it's intensive. And if places don't yeah. realize that they, they want you to solve difficult problems, but don't realize that it takes concentration or, you know, whatever you need. Um, it, it just seems inhumane, you know? Yeah. There's repetitive uh, stress in injuries and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully nobody ever has fear of losing their job because they didn't go to a meeting or because they decided, oh, I'm going to work remote today. Yeah. Um, I think that used to be common. You used, I mean, we used to have to go to the office all the time. Um, yeah. We remember that. We Jake and I used to work together. At the same company like we're old timers <laughs> yeah well it was kind of old it was like five years ago yeah it's, it's been a long time mm. um so i kind of want to wrap up here because we're approaching an hour and a half uh, of course i could talk to you all day oh that's I, awful nice same I, here i think we both have to get back to work at some point um maybe so, so is there anything else that we missed or that you uh, think we should cover real quick? Not that I can think of. Thank you so much for having me. You did such a great job. I was, <laughs> this is my first podcast. I was very nervous and, um, awesome. and you made me very comfortable. And so uh, I hope, I hope everyone enjoyed their time. Thank you everyone for coming. And, um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Thank you. So don't think there's anything we missed that we can't cover in, in uh, the second edition, I guess, part two. Um, so real quick, uh, I got some resources down that you mentioned. You mentioned Dave Farley from Continuous Delivery. He's great. Uh, of course, you mentioned Bob Martin's series on clean code and clean coder and the Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. Mm. Um, are there any resources that you recommend for anything that we've talked about today or just from learning leadership skills and team lead skills in general? Deming. Um, w. Edwards Deming is sort of the father or founder of lean manufacturing. Okay. Um, he, he's, I, I've quoted him throughout this, this talk without, without giving him adequate credit. He's the guy who um, fixed Toyota way back in the day. And mm. oh, a lot okay. of the ideas that are sort of, in agile or in lean or whatever in devops really kind of started with deming back in the 40s so i've been reading more deming i try to memorize his things um but it's like every line of the book is a line worth remembering so it's a very slow <laughs> it's a very slow read yeah 
Yeah. You seem to be good at remembering things. Oh, I got you tricked. That's half the battle. <laughs> All right. So uh, do you have any immediate plans, anything cool that you're working on now that you want to share goals, anything? Uh, I, I don't have any goals with my life. <laughs> I don't have anything that I'm really working on at the moment. Just enjoying it's, yourself, relaxing with your chickens. Yeah, exactly. Just trying to get through this, uh, the dark part of winter. Yeah. What about you? Um, my goal, the only thing I can think of since I'm going to New England next oh, yeah. week is getting to drink so much maple syrup. But I'm going to go off on a tangent, so I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> if okay. you want to know about my maple syrup habits, you can join my Discord. Uh, we can talk more about that there. Maple so, syrup. Is your username maple syrup addict? No, it's not. Oh, okay. But if you saw my cabinets, you, you would think it was. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you uh, end up thinking of anything else, any more goals or resources or anything, feel free to share them with me and then I can share them with everybody too. Sure. Well, thanks again to everybody and thanks yeah. to you, Gwen. Yeah. And any questions that are left in the chat, I'm going to take note of them. And then uh, part two, hopefully you're up for part two. Uh, we can answer those. Sure. at that time. I'll add them to the list. So real quick, uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out? Um, I don't, I don't really do social that much. I have a LinkedIn account. Um, but feel free to reach out to me at my email, uh, Jake the corn at gmail.com. Jake the corn at gmail.com. I'm, I'm just getting older. I'm not as cool. Not up with the technology. Yep. <laughs> All right. So you can find him at Gmail. I also shared his meetup link. If you want to hear oh, yeah. some of his great talks and information, you can join his meetup group, which I believe is virtual. Mm -hmm. So hear about testing and all sorts of things. Yep. Lots of rambling. <laughs> All right. So I hope you got something out of the stream today. I really appreciate all of you joining and all of your questions. If you have any feedback, I would love to hear it. So you can also join my Discord or leave a comment on this video on YouTube and let me know your feedback, thoughts, comments, questions, or even if you have anything to add. So if you think uh, we missed something on one of the topics we talked about or something like that, you know, we're always trying to learn. So I would love to hear about that too. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on today, Jake. This is one of the most fun conversations I ever had. Oh, it was great talking with you. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, we'll schedule something real soon. Bye, everybody.